Welcome everyone to another Artist Loft Drawing class. Uh, I'm your instructor, Adrian Hodge, and uh, tonight's class is a one-off class on drawing flower vignettes using colored pencils. And uh, we've got a lot to cover in an hour to try to get to our, our completed um, examples there. So I am just gonna dive right in and switch to my tabletop view. Um, don't forget to tag your work with the hashtags uh, make it with Michaels or Michaels classes um, with whatever you complete tonight or even if you've got a, a work in progress. And if you want to follow me directly uh, on Instagram, I am Adrian Hodge Art. Um, I'm on Facebook, Adrian Hodge Fine Art. And Chanel can drop my a link tree in the chat if you want to find me on all those places a little uh, faster. And if you're watching this later on YouTube, you can find me easily by just searching Adrian Hodge. Um, Austin, Texas might make me come up a little faster. Um, a couple of classes that we have coming up that I just wanted to mention are um, a couple of premium classes that we have coming up. There's going to be two premium classes this month. Uh, the first one is next week on Wednesday, March 9th, and it's on drawing head tilts. So we've had a lot going on in the uh, figure drawing and portrait drawing realm lately. So uh, I've been kind of sprinkling in a lot of classes that focus on different aspects of portraits and uh, drawing the human figure in some capacity. So uh, head tilts is something that I've alluded to and maybe had uh, some little moments about in previous classes on facial proportions, but it's a big aspect of facial proportions. So if you're new to portrait drawing, you definitely want to sign up for this drawing head tilts class because I have a feeling I will refer back to it quite a bit going forward because it's just so important to um, factor in how those facial proportions change whenever the head is tilted in any direction. When we did our basic facial proportions class, I focused on a photograph where uh, I was facing straight forward and we didn't have to worry about the head being tilted on its axis in any way. So anyway, that is a great class you want to, you'll want to sign up for and the link to sign up was just dropped in the chat. And if you're watching later on YouTube, you can um, find the class up until March 9th um, on the Michaels website under online and uh, free and premium classes. But the recording for that class will only be sent to students who registered for the class. So make sure you sign up um, if you wanna have access to that one. And then um, there's gonna be a charcoal class in between um, the, the two premium classes this month. So the first one's on the 9th and then drawing realistic lips is on uh, March 23rd. And we'll be drawing a variety of lips here with some different light on the photograph, just like I did when I did the drawing eyes class where I had some uh, photographs that were a little more in uh, focus as far as the light and a little more highly contrasted as far as the, the light and detail in the photographs. So I'll be working from those three photos. Um, and I believe those are, yeah, the photos were provided in the supply list that I was working from. And you can work from the photos I'm working from, or you can use your own photographs. And I'll always have some awesome tips and tricks for any, uh, you know, specific featured class like this. Um, this one will focus on tips and tricks for drawing realistic lips using graphite. And that's on the 23rd. Okay, wanted to make sure that I mentioned those. Um, okay, so I'm excited about this little class because I think it's just so fun. And I provided reference images um, in the supply list. And if you didn't get a chance to uh, print those out, I'll just flash them on the screen right now so you can maybe take a, a, a screenshot real quick. Um, so there's that one which was in the middle of my example. 
um, this one of lovely vintage rose and then this one so I guess that was not quite in the order that I have them on my my example here but uh, there those are and they are also in the supply list for the class if you're watching later on YouTube you can um, easily access those and print them out so you've got those photographs we've got the artist loft colored pencil set I believe I have a 36 piece set here then you are going to want uh, the colored pencil blender. I will definitely be using the Artist Loft colored pencil blender, and I don't have any substitutes um, for that. Uh, we're going to be using the Artist Loft opaque marker. If you don't have uh, this particular uh, opaque marker, you can use a white gel pen, maybe, or any white ink that you happen to have, but that's how I got those little sparkly moments to happen and I feel like that really makes it so um oh I just realized I got this totally turned upside down um <laughs> anyway and then you'll want some uh sketching pencils although I am probably going to do very minimal sketching and dive right in but you might want to do some sketching first and I'll definitely do a little sketching off to the side to help get you started and then I've got an Artist Loft synthetic eraser. And then I've got the uh, Artist Loft, um, I forget what these are exactly called on the supply list, but the traceable uh, circles here. So we're going to be using those to trace a circle, but you can substitute this with any round object that you have that you could easily trace a circle with. So, you know, grab your little succulent pot or, you know, piece of uh, a tape or not a piece of tape, but a um, some tape, you know, the circle inside of tape, anything you want to use to trace a circle, or you can practice drawing some circles freehand, but I think having um, this is very helpful for making these little vignettes, especially because we're going to be going right up against that edge and having a perfect circle is going to really make it pop. Okay, any questions about supplies or substituting supplies before we get started drawing these flowers? I see somebody is being very particular about the definition of a vignette. Yes, typically it's where it fades out and <laughs> focuses, the, the focus is on the center and then you've got blurred edges around the side, but it's, it's a cute word and I thought it was catchy and I thought it described what these were. Um, and so I called them vignettes. So um, I'm very big on the proper use of vocabulary though. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, okay. This is why I need to keep the chat closed because I get so distracted by stuff like that. Um, but thank you. Okay. Adrian, we do have one question before you start. All right. What is what size did you use for your circles? Um, it looks like I used the not quite it. Oh yeah, I guess that was it. Uh, the two and a quarter the biggest one on this, this sheet. I think it came with a few different sheets, but this is the one I used. So two and a quarter inches there. Okay, any other questions before I get rolling? That's it for now. Okay. I'm trying to just make my chat window go away. There we go. Okay, thank you for your patience while I do that. Okay, so we're just gonna do some quick sketching and then I'm gonna dive in, like I'm gonna trace my circle using colored pencil. So I'm gonna draw completely with the colored pencil um, in just a moment uh, with the on my final page, but I just wanna do some really quick um, sketching help for those who are overwhelmed by a flower. Um, and it's gonna sound a lot like, the, the tips that I give for drawing pretty much everything for those 
all my regulars in the in the group who who come every week and I see you and appreciate you. Um, but for those who are just joining um, and want to know my kind of go to tricks for sketching out any shape or even if you just like this repeated. Um, the first thing we're going to do is look for the shapes of the uh, shadows. So the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light. And there's a lot of interesting shapes on this rose. So drawing a rose can be very complicated if you try to give everything a hard edge, but not everything has a hard edge. In fact, almost nothing has a hard edge. If we think about the value scale, from uh, absolute light to absolute dark, um, zero being the absolute white highlights and 10 being the absolute black. Where on this, uh, this photograph are you seeing an absolute black shape or an absolute black line? Drop a little description of where in the photograph you're seeing that in the chat. I'm going to wait because I want to let people look and, and find these things because it's going to be the most helpful throughout. Okay, where are you seeing the absolute white then? Um, all right, somebody saying right and left sides um, in the at the edge of the flower. Good. Um, the highlights on the tip of the petal. Okay, somebody was answering my, where am I seeing the absolute whites? And then, yeah, on the stem behind the rose, there's an absolute black shape right here. Um, okay, yeah, that's pretty much it, right? It's this shape right here is an absolute black. There's a few little moments at the edge of the flower and some edges of the petals where it almost feels a little uh, burnt right there um where it looks a little bit there's a few random shapes but otherwise that's where everything else is pretty light in this photograph right we might have some dark green over here that i would classify as like an eight or a nine on the value scale it's not an absolute black so uh take note of that where those shapes are and then when we're looking at the pink um of the rose which is the dominant color um in, in the rose where, you know, if we're thinking of the medium pink, like if we were to have a tube of paint that was this color pink and we had to add white to it to make it a light pink. And then if we wanted to make it dark pink, we would have to add um, maybe some, uh, some brown. Black would probably um, wash it out a little bit, but maybe some brown or a tiny bit of gray to get it to a, a darker pink, um, where are we? But it doesn't get to an absolute black, right? If we were to have a value scale with pink in the middle and then the darkest shade of uh, maybe like a purplish pink that we're seeing is in the center right here. I'm just gonna outline that irregular shape where I'm seeing that darker uh, pink or almost purple or brown there. Um, is right there. And then everywhere else would be about from a zero to a five, zero being white and five being right in the middle of that, you know, straight out of the tube pink, right? So when we're using our pink colored pencil to get the uh, darkest shade of that pink, we're going to use pressure on the pencil to get the darkest shade of pink. We're going to mix it with some other colors right there maybe a couple of different pinks to get it to match that hue um, or pure color that we're seeing in the middle there. Um, but mostly we're gonna leave some paper blank for the, the white highlights and there's a lot of white highlights. So uh, right here, right here, and I'm just outlining all of these organic shapes. Uh, when we did the drawing hair class, we talked about mapping out these shapes in the hair. And uh, when I asked people to give me a organic shape or another shape of something else that we could label the uh, 
you know, some of the shapes that we were looking at. Somebody said it looked like an island, like the mass of the hair that we were looking at. So I want you to apply that same thing when we look at all of these various organic shapes that we're seeing. So try not to see it as a rose and try to see it as all of these various different shapes of colors and light. And if it helps, you might turn uh, the photograph upside down, although it still looks like a rose upside down, but sometimes uh, turning things upside down can help disconnect our, our brain a little bit from what we're looking at. And you know that urge that we might have to draw this kind of stock image of a rose that we might have in our mind. If I were to draw my stock image of a rose, like a cartoon-ish rose, I might do something like this. That's kind of what my brain wants to read as a rose. And that's like extremely simplified, but that is maybe what I might be trying to force onto this. Or you might, you know, see those little squiggly shapes, but like get away from looking at the squiggle shapes that you're seeing, the organic shapes and end up kind of drawing something that just resembles, that would be great too. I just want you to see it more in terms of organic shapes and uh, look at the shapes and observe them and try to draw them like you're seeing them and not as you're imagining. So uh, I'm just gonna start drawing this rose based on the shapes that I'm seeing. So this big one right here, what could we label this? What could we call this other than the edge of this rose petal highlight. I'm seeing like a comb, like a hair comb, or maybe um, a blade of some sort, like a switch blade, maybe with something hanging off of it, but this whole shape kind of feels like a switch blade shape to me. So if I were to draw that shape, and I'm drawing really dark with a dark pencil just so that you can see what I'm doing um, I want you to draw lightly with an H pencil so that you can erase if you need to. But I'm seeing something like that. Somebody said a mountain range. That's a good one. Anything else? Okay, well, let's do that for all of them. So I'm not going to, well, we're not going to do it for all of them because that would take all night. But this is how I want you to approach drawing all of these flower shapes. So we're looking for what else could we label that? And maybe you just pick it apart and say there's a triangle on the end of a elongated cylinder. And the triangle is pretty irregular in shape. I wanted to label it like a piece of lettuce, but a <laughs> lettuce leaf is exactly like a rose leaf almost, but or a cabbage leaf. But sometimes even just doing that, just calling it cabbage somehow might be easier for your brain. Like, oh, I can draw a cabbage, but a rose, that's hard. Um, whatever you have to do to make it so that you're not labeling it um, in a way that's making it more challenging than it has to be. Okay, so I'm just stacking all of these shapes on top of each other. And then we're gonna be looking at the various colors that we're seeing to blend. And we're gonna blur out the backgrounds on a lot of these um, until we reach the edge of our circles. But as I'm drawing all of these, and I'm gonna dive in with the colored pencils here in just a moment, I, this is how I'm going to approach it. I'm going to um, isolate the colors that are reoccurring. And so if I've got the, the pinks, I'm gonna look for all the shapes where I'm seeing that color pink or maybe two or three colors. I'm gonna to try to use two and three colors in any one area. And I'm gonna be looking for the shapes that I'm seeing uh, where I should use that pink or the shapes where I should be using this kind of eggplant purple or the shapes where I should be using this orange. And I'll admit this overall shape is kind of a tricky one, this like big honeycomb shape here. So I am gonna simplify that into the larger shape and kind of fill it all in with orange and then you know alternate like a little pattern here between orange and, and browns and blacks um, to make that 
happen a little more quickly. And then when I get to this uh, photograph, it's a lot of repetitive shapes here. It's a lot of this kind of Hershey's kiss shape on this rosebud. Um, what else? And then this is going to be very similar to the, the rose. And this is going to be very similar to the center of this flower where I'm going to draw more the mass of it and then just have some little stippling dots for um, some various colors that I'm seeing within there. And then we're going to add some accents using the white, um, uh, the white opaque marker to kind of create some contrast and help it pop. Okay, so that is the approach I'm going to take for all of these. And we've got about 30 seven minutes to do it and I think we can. Okay, so I'm going to actually go a little off script and use this little artist loft um, sketchbook because the paper uh, has a perforated edge that tears out and it's smaller and then I can have my photograph on screen at the same time. And also I ran out of my good artist loft drawing paper and it's a little thicker than the sketchbook paper that I was just working with. So I'm just gonna use a sheet of this paper. So I might uh, go a little smaller on my circles to make them all fit. Um, and I'm just gonna eyeball that diagonal shape that I made. And I got really lucky whenever I did this one. I didn't like measure it. I didn't plan to even do the diagonal thing when I first started. I just started over here with this one. And then I thought, oh, I'll do a diagonal line. And it lined up perfectly on that page. But if you want to you know, grab a ruler or something to help line things up for yourself, that might uh, be good. But I'm going to go a little smaller and use the one and three fourths circle here and I'm just going to eyeball it again. I'm going to use my green colored pencil since that's the color that's kind of on the outer edge of the, the frame in the photograph. I'll just go ahead and draw all three of them. And the diagonal down the page. And feel free to do these in any pattern or shape that you want. You can make them stand alone on a piece of paper. You don't even have to use the, the circle. Uh, frame if you don't want to. It's just a fun little idea here. Let me get a little closer. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the rose. Everything on the screen at the same time, I think I can. Okay, so. I've mentioned um, an app on here in the, the past. I'm gonna mention it again. You do not have to use it. And um, there are lots of, of different kinds of apps that do this, um, but there's one called uh, Palette Cam. And it is an app that uh, will take a photograph and um, you upload the photograph into the app and it'll put a cursor over um, just some part in the photograph and you tap the little circle at the bottom and it will start to create a palette based on all the colors that you tap on in the image. And that is really helpful to just see a variety of colors because a lot of people when they look at a photograph like this of a rose, just kind of see the pink and maybe the yellow and maybe like the green on the edge. Um, but it's hard for them to see, you know, like that darker purple that I was talking about about here or 
or brown or uh, specifically the grayish blue that's showing up. Um, but that grayish blue is what's really um, kind of suggesting the, it really helps to suggest the rose and so that our eyes look at it and see the rose. So um, you might check out that app if you have a hard time seeing a variety of colors in something like this. So I'm just gonna start drawing all of those shapes with my pinks. And even though I was talking about getting those shapes as accurate as possible, we just wanna get somewhere close to those, you know, just get a variety of shapes going because the more you observe a variety of shapes, the more the eye is going to, you know, the viewer's eye that's looking at this is going to read it as an organic thing like a rose um, because things in nature aren't always, you know, perfectly symmetrical or, um, you know, they don't have the same repeating shape over and over again. Not always. Um, obviously, we see lots of different patterns in nature that do a variety of things, but Okay, so I've got the some of those organic shapes. I'm seeing the center of the rose, and I'm just picking out those shapes that are jumping out at me the most, like the ones that caught my attention the most when I was sketching, like this one somebody labeled as a mountain range for the edge there. And that's gonna end up being white in the center, but all along the edge of that is going to be light pink and gray and, and purple here, so. Adrian, there's a couple comments saying that they cannot see the pink that you're drawing. Okay, well, um, I'm drawing really light <laughs> since a lot of these are gonna end up being highlights. Um, let me see if I can get it closer to the screen here. So mm, that is the best I can do without pressing down. Let me go ahead and start pressing down so that we can see what I'm doing. Um, so I'm gonna use uh, this lavender uh, purple and I've got the just basic pink here. I'm gonna use a medium brown in the center there. Pencils are rolling across my desk. And then the gray and the sky blue. Those are the main colors I'm gonna use for the, the petals. And then also I'm using this yellow okra and golden yellow and this clay yellow as well. And these come in the, the 36 piece set. So once I start pressing down a little harder, you're, you're gonna be able to see, see what I'm drawing a little more clearly. So I'll go ahead and start doing that. Um, okay, so I'm using a circular tonal shading motion. I was trying to think before the class started what classes I might have uh, Chanel go grab the links to and drop in the chat and I couldn't think of one and then I think the most helpful one to refer back to would be that very first class we ever had in this series on um, introduction to graphite and drawing forms because as I often say it comes down to following the contours of a form and the um, you know elevational lines. I'm not going to have any aside about that right now because we just really don't have time in this particular class but mainly as I'm applying my uh, value and, and colors here I'm going to be following the contours of the, the form of the rose. So just curving when it curves. Um, if it's kind of the inside here, think about what the elevation is. And I can maybe draw that directly on the photograph a little bit as a little aside. I'll do it with my pen so you can see. But think about what the elevation would be. The class on drawing a uh, perspective drawing of a coffee mug would be helpful for this as well because there's sort of an inner uh, curve happening like this inner depth. But that's something, you know, after years of practice that I do just automatically, but that, you know, if you're new to drawing, you might find yourself 
um, you know, just wanting to color side to side. And it may seem that that's what I'm doing, just kind of filling in these colors, but I'm going to be following these curves as I'm applying. So that's sort of the elevation that I'm seeing there, or this is the elevation that I'm seeing here. And I know I'm really marking up my photo here, but this is very helpful if you are brand new to, to drawing. Okay. So as I'm putting that lavender in and blending, I'm sort of following that curve and it may not seem like I'm doing anything too drastic there, but I'm being mindful of the, the curve. The elevational dips and curves that are happen happening. Uh, the class on drawing drapery goes into that as well and follows you know, the path of elevational dips and curves that are happening on drapery, which is very similar to flower petals. Um, there was also a class on, or several classes on value drawing on flowers in the early, um, early days of this artist loft drawing series that goes into applying uh, different types of values, uh, stippling, scribbling, hatching, cross hatching, and doing it in a way that follows on flowers, that follows the contours of the, the flowers and leaves and, and things like that. So, okay, so I started filling in some of those value shapes and colors that I'm seeing there. I'm going to jump to the background on this, um, this photograph. So I need some dark green and black an emerald green. We're using a lot of the colors that come in this 36 piece set here tonight. Hey, Adrian, um, are you able to move to the, the reference photo to the other side? Um, they said that your hand's covering it, so they're not able to see it that well. Thank you. And then um, I know you mentioned a class that you recommended. What was the name of the class? I'm trying to find it so I can link it for them. It was uh, Intro to Graphite and Drawing Forms. Okay. We actually did that class twice. So, okay, so I'm just looking for the shapes of the bigger shapes of leaves in the background that are, are jumping out at me. My webcam kind of does kind of a, a fisheye thing. And I'm, I was worried if I put it over here at the edge, it would kind of distort my drawing. But um, if that is what's requested, then I'm happy to switch them. Okay, so there's a lot of dark green in the background on the, in the rose image here. So I'm just, making some little blobs of dark green. So I'm just looking at the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light. I'm trying to use two and three colors in any one area. So I'm not just gonna use one green on this, this background area. I'm gonna use lots of different greens. I'm really approaching this like I would a painting where I'm building up layers. I'm working general to specific. I'm looking for uh, colors and shapes that are reoccurring and outlining those. Let's see, I wanted to finish, kind of got distracted and started doing the background before I finished drawing my rows here. So I'm using the clay yellow to put in the edge of the, the petals that I'm seeing a lot of that yellow. and brown on the edge of the rose petals. And once I've got everything blocked off, where I've got the main colors that I'm seeing on the rose, 
all the main shapes and everything that I'm trying to um, emphasize, then I can start to build up different layers of colors um, and start to blend things together. So I'm just going to fill in a lot of this background with my pastel green. And then I'll go back in with the emerald green. And when I get to the edge of the rose, that's where I'm going to really press down with these different greens and maybe the black a little bit to create that darker edge that we're seeing that creates that contrast and makes it pop forward. And I'm aware of the time. I'm going to put that black diagonal stem in there because that really creates an interesting moment. So if you find yourself getting kind of bored with the image or like there's parts of it that you're like, oh, this is just too much, feel free to make edits. You know, there's no rule that says you have to follow a photograph exactly. Feel free to edit out the, the parts that are not as interesting to you or, you know, maybe kind of blur some some things about it more than they are actually blurred in the, the photograph. Um, you know, you want it to be joyful and fun and a, a nice experience for you. And if it's just becoming tedious and repetitive or you're getting kind of lost in those rose petals, this is the nice thing about drawing small like this is it'll, you'll get to the point where you've filled up this little circle pretty quickly. But I'm just bouncing around like I would if I was painting. Working with colored pencils, the way to make colored pencils really shine and look more polished um, like this and not necessarily, you know, flat or or dull as they, you know, you do run the risk of, of doing sometimes with colored pencils when you don't layer them and pay attention to um, contours and things like this. The, the easiest way to sidestep making them, you know, feel dull or anything like that is just using lots of colors in any one area. So layering your colors and, um, and blending. So we've got that colored pencil blender that we're gonna use once we get this pretty full, um, like we have multiple layers. We want something for that blender to grab a hold of. And um, when I start running low on time, which I'm starting to do, I'm gonna jump to my more completed ones here. I kind of try to fast forward a little bit in this process if I can. Let me do that real quick. So I'm just gonna fill in with my pastel green here, all of this background lightly. So I'm not pushing down on my pressure on the pencil and I wanna build up multiple layers. Um, and I'm doing it quickly because I'm trying to get ahead of you guys and you know get to the point of that more completed product that I showed you. Um, but take your time doing this. There's no rush. But my uh, point about the colored pencil blender is that if you were to go in too soon with the blender and start to use it, it um, it's kind of hard to go back on top of it and um, and and blend, or it's hard to add layers on top of it. You can, but you're going to run into, you're going to create kind of a texture issue on the page. So, and, you know, feel free to do that a little bit just to like see what I'm talking about and then be like, oh, I see why she said to wait to use the blender because it can really create um, a texture that's hard to continue to layer on top of. So you wanna wait till you have multiple layers and lots of colors for it to, to grab onto. Um, and the way I'm gonna create contrast as quickly as possible here is just to have some of those sharp edges come in. So that dark brown is creating that almost solid dark edge that we're seeing there. And I'm gonna combine that with the black. 
The rose also took me the longest out of all of these. Well, that middle one also took quite a bit of time. So, but the last one went pretty fast. So hopefully I'm not gonna run out of time here. If I do, I'll just jump ahead. Okay, and then what we're planning to do with the white, I want you to plan ahead for that by drawing a few little circles with the green and leaving those blank paper because that's going to be easier. And you can put that white um, on top of it and get a, a white point to stand out on top, but it's easier to just leave some uh, blank paper. And then to create that hard edge, I'm just starting to put more pressure with the green and the brown and everywhere that I'm that I have more of a, a hard edge in the photo. And doing that along the outer edge of that circular shape will also start to create the effect that we're looking for. And that's going to really make the rose pop forward. So we're really making the rose come forward more by creating contrast with the, uh, the background than we are the rose itself because the rose itself never really gets that dark. So even when you're putting that full pressure on the, the pinks and, and purples, you're not going to create as much of a, a you know, pop as you will when you put that dark green in and make that crisp edge along the side. So I want to dull down my green that I'm seeing. I'm gonna use this dark green. Don't want it to be quite so bright green, but I also want the edge to pop there. Okay, I want to move on to one of the, the next colors. Let me go ahead and use my colored pencil blender in a few spots here just to see how that will blend those colors together. It really kind of creates this continuous. Um, tone out of those those colors. It kind of pulls it all together and starts to create this almost illustrated um, quality that that you're seeing here. And then with the white, you can either leave those those areas blank where you don't color anything, or you can put just one little dot there. And that is not really popping out the way I want it to. Let me see if the gel pen, the gel pen's sitting on top of that, that blender a little better. Okay, let me move on to the second flower. I'm gonna start with the orange. Since that's the biggest shape coming out here. Let's see, did I get it all on screen? Okay, so we've got that kind of dew drop or gumdrop shape that I'm seeing to the, the orange. Let me get a piece of paper underneath my my drawing paper so we're not seeing the photograph through there. That was a little distracting. Okay, so then I'm going to go in and kind of put a bunch of little half circle or like crescent moon shapes. And I know that they're not quite that, but it's going to help me fill it in a little quicker here. So maybe some little dots, some stippling dots or the little half moon shape. It's just gonna help me fill in that alternating pattern. It's almost like a brick pattern that you're seeing. And it, it is very, um, 
very symmetrical. You could almost draw it like a crisscross pattern all the way down and make them line up like that. So however you want to do that. And then we're going to fill in the center with um, maybe a combination of dark blue, brown, and black. And I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for this class here is to, you know, just look for more colors in any area. If I just did that orange and I didn't add these other colors, or if I just did orange and maybe black, it's not going to have the dimension that using dark blue and brown will have. And for any painters in the audience, um, the easiest way to make black if you don't have black paint in a tube is to mix dark blue and brown. So it's going to give the impression of black with just a little more dimension to it. And again, we want multiple layers of this to really start to make it feel three-dimensional. And that's probably the thing when I'm planning these classes that I forget the most is how I'm like, oh, I can do this in an hour, or I try to watch the timer and not go over an hour when I'm making my demos, but then there's always something in the class that takes up a little more time than I meant. And we don't always get to finish these demos in the, these one hour classes, but we're going to get it as close to it as possible. And I'm definitely giving you everything you need to keep working on your own. So just use multiple colors, follow the three dimensional elevation um, of the forms that you're looking at try to draw organic shapes based on observation rather than just repeating, you know, because it would be very easy to just repeat this petal shape on this flower like, like that all the way around, right? But if I look closely and just draw the irregular shapes that I'm seeing in the center that are dark purple, and the shape of the green that I'm seeing in between. Oh, I want a dark green, not that green. That I'm seeing green and these little keyhole shapes in between, that I'm gonna end up with a much more interesting, realistic um, shape. I'm gonna start to create the illusion of this flower more than if I just did that with one color. So I'm gonna use a combination of pink and purple on all of these, and we just want them to have an interesting organic shape and like look at them and see how they're a little bit different. And the imperfections in a flower or in any still life item and the dents in a piece of fruit or these little discolorations on the petals, those are what are gonna make it feel more interesting and realistic as well. So we can put those in and then we're gonna layer our background colors. I'm gonna go a little faster this time. So, and I'm editing a bit out of this photo as well. Although I do wanna put that one that one shape right here underneath, because that's just very interesting. I'm using the olive green to do that organic shape that I'm seeing. And then the pink petals coming off of that. There's a lot of gray in the background. 
of this image right here so I can start to build up that gray. I can draw a few circles with the gray for my sparkles at the end with the white. I really think those little white circles just add something and that's definitely a stylized thing that I do in my work. So if you really emphasize those, please tag me in your work um, since that's a, it's a very Adrian Hodge art-esque technique there to put those little ethereal sparkles in. If you check out my work, you'll know what I mean. Okay, and then we're just building up multiple layers before we use that blender so that the blender has something to grab onto and I'm often saying that whenever I talk about those tortillions, the um, to blend the graphite as well, that you know you can use one of those at any stage. You know that it will, you know, definitely move some stuff around, but it's going to work better if it has something to grab onto. Okay. Oh my gosh, we have seven minutes left in the class. All right, let me move on to this third image here. I'm just gonna go back to this one just to see what the completed one will look like after we continue building up multiple layers and taking our time, which we're quickly running out of here. Okay, so with our yellow rose, we're looking for a lot of teardrop shapes or Hershey's kiss shapes. Um, spring bud green, just to get started here. Although that's not quite the green that I want. Let's try the bright green. end up with something like that with a lot of yellow in the middle. Yeah, even with this yellow, don't just use one yellow because that's going to end up just feeling flat. I mean, do whatever you want. I'm not the boss of you, but it's going to look more multidimensional if you use three different yellows right there and blend them together. And then take note of, you know, if we really get in there and look more closely, there's a little shape of a darker yellow right here. Um, so yeah, make it more multidimensional by using lots of yellows as opposed to just one yellow, because that's going to end up feeling kind of flat and follow the contours of the form. So think about the elevation. Like when I just used those two yellows there, that still doesn't quite have the dimension that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna really layer another yellow in there and try leaving, you know, all of the yellows visible. Don't cover up, you know, all of them necessarily. And then if I use my blender on top of that, that could also give it the sense that I'm looking for there. With the green, if I use three different greens right here and look for where it gets darker in the center of that, that bud leaf and blend three different greens together right here, I'm going to end up with something that's more 
has more dimensions. And notice how I'm adding those, I'm following the elevational curve there and applying it to the, the contours of the form. That's not the green I want. And I keep picking it up again anyway. And then leaving a little space here for that white highlight that I'm seeing at the edge, that is also going to create some interesting contrast. So if you haven't colored that all in just yet, notice how there's a little edge of white there. And I don't think I did that in my other one. I didn't, but that would really help create some contrast. And like on this stalk, if I kind of follow the curve that I'm seeing there, I know it's small, but that's going to create more contrast and interest. If I add a little black here in the center, it's going to also create some contrast and interest. So really try to find three or four colors in any one area. Follow the contours of the form. If you don't know what that means, you can check out that other class on uh, Intro to Graphite and Drawing Forms. Wait to use your blender until the end. And then if you still are wanting more contrast, go back in with that opaque white or a gel pen and you can add these little moments of white. Let me see if I can put some white back in on the edge of that, that petal and make it pop even more. Yeah, that looks pretty good. All right, any questions about anything that I didn't cover? I know I kind of fast forwarded past a lot of things here to make sure that I touched on each one of these photographs and how to approach them. But like, is there any aspect of any of these that you'd like me to explain how I did it real quick before we say goodnight? I'm also going to be on Instagram live right after class. I do a little Instagram live um, on my Instagram um, at Adrian Hodge Art. Um, you can join me at 7.05 p.m. And if you have any lingering questions about the class or the techniques, I can talk about it there. Um, it sounds like a couple people want some more information on blending. Um, Amy says she's totally clueless on how you made the background look blurry. And then Allie asks, should we add black over dark green to darken color? Okay, let me go back to the rose one since that's the one that I got the farthest on the background there. So the way that I made it look blurry was I just didn't push any of my crisp details. Um, so I kind of looked at the various colors that I'm seeing um, in the background of that photograph. I left out the yellow, um, but you could put that yellow in there as well. But just kind of what are the main blobby shapes that were jumping out at me? And so I'm seeing light green, dark green, brown blobby shapes. So put those blobby shapes in um, using light green, dark green, and brown and maybe a little bit of black. And then I left some areas blank for those white uh, highlighted areas to pop. So the blender really kind of helps pull it all together and make it nice and blurry like that. But I'm just layering these different blobby colors together. And like I said, you can go back over the blender, like I did the blender here already, and then I'm going back on top of it. Just if you use the blender too much, sometimes it feels kind of, you feel a texture and it's harder to like layer another color on top. Um, but yeah, I mean, I layered just, I'm just focusing on this one little spot right here, since that's the one area where I got the farthest layering colors. Um, this area right here, I have not used the blender on yet. So you can see how it's like black and a couple of different greens. And so I 
if I take the blender on top of that now, it should kind of blur it for me. And it starts to create that, that effect. And same thing, you know, in the, the rose petals, like if I use my blender on top of there, it starts to pull those colors together. But it's not going to do that if you only have one pink. You need a few different color pinks to make it, you know, to make the blender, give the blender something to grab onto. Or like right here on this, when I use the blender on top of that, how it kind of pulls it all together, right? And creates a more multi-dimensional effect. And same thing here, the blender really creates that kind of blurry illustrated effect that you're seeing in, in all of my examples. I just didn't want to use the blender too quickly, but this is a good time to just do it real quick and show you the, the magic of the colorless blender. Does that answer that question? I think so. Um, there was one other question. Can you repeat what it was? Yeah, actually a few more came in as you were sh showing that as well. Um, let me find Allie's question really quick. Um, should we add black on top of dark green to make it darker? Yeah, adding black to anything will make it darker. And the more and then, you put on it will also make it darker as well. Sorry. Um, and then there is a couple questions about your blender. Um, does your blender use a solvent? I, I don't know. This is just the Artist Loft colored pencil blender. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what is in it. Um, the I don't believe if you're worried about it being toxic, um, I don't think we need to worry too much about it. Um, formulated to blend wax based colored pencils. I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question. Sorry. <laughs> Does it self clean? I saw that. Um, you can kind of draw on a blank piece of paper to get any colors that stick to it off, but it does, um, it does pick up the colors as you're, you're working with it. So you'll want to kind of draw on a blank piece of paper to get any of any excess color off, but, um, the next time you use it, those, you know, they might still be on there. No, it does not self-clean. You do need to kind of get some of those colors off. All right, well, we are past time, but if we have any other, um, you can join me on Instagram Live. Um, in just a couple of moments, I will log on uh, to Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art and um, I'll be there for about 30 minutes to do a little Q&A um, if you have any extra questions and if you're watching this on YouTube later I'll pin um, or I'll, I'll just leave the Instagram live up on my IGTV so it'll be easy to find again later um, and I'd love to see some of y'all's drawings but I know we ran out of time so um, please do um, post them on uh, social media and tag me um, at Adrian Hodge Art so I can be sure to see your lovely flower drawings and um, yeah tag them with make it with Michael's and Michael's classes as well. Thank you all so much. Have a great night.